Welcome everyone to the fourth plenary of the International Conference on Sustainable Development. We are thrilled that you are with us today for this plenary. We will be speaking to Minister Erica Munez of Panama and Dr. Agnes Calabata. Professor Sachs, over to you for our first section with Minister Munez. Greetings, everybody. Uh, I'm really excited. We, uh, we're going to have a fantastic uh, discussion uh, with the uh, Minister Munez, who's a, a terrific dynamic leader you're going to see in just a moment. Uh, she has uh, had leadership responsibilities uh, throughout uh, her country's government, throughout Panama's government, uh, but also a tremendous international experience uh, in international commerce, global negotiations. Uh, and so she uh, has been a part of uh, uh, our very dynamic uh, global uh, negotiating and political uh, and sustainable development environment. Uh, Panama is stepping forward to be one of the world's uh, leaders in uh, not only getting to zero, but as I understand it, get going negative on emissions. So I want to understand what, what that means uh, in, in Panama's context. But Minister, thank you so much for joining uh, ICSD. We're really thrilled. Uh, are you in New York, actually, or are we speaking to you from Panama? I am in New York. You're in New York for the General Assembly. Fantastic. So welcome. I hope uh, all is well. Panama is uh, staking out a, a very bold position. I think you are, uh, you're pushing that forward. Could you explain what that position is for everybody? Sure, thank you. Excited to be here. Um, I, I just actually finished, and I think it's very relevant to mention, I just finished a meeting with Suriname's Minister of Foreign Affairs, as well as delegates from Bhutan, the three countries that are carbon negative right now in, on our planet. And um, I think it's fascinating as we discuss and we're trying to form an alliance that we'll present at the COP26. We're very different countries, yet we were all, were, the three of us were able to achieve being carbon negative, which means that it, in our view that everybody can, and, and I'll start um, the Panama's view. You know, we have one of the main waterways uh, in the world. We are economy, you don't think of Panama, you think, well, they only, their economy is based of tourism. No, we also have uh, a robust industry base of uh, banking and, uh, and uh, services. Yet we were also able to achieve uh, being carbon negative. And I, I think it, this leadership should also motivate other key players to do the same. And I think as we are discussing how to forge this alliance, I think some of the different strategies that the three of us have adapted is very interesting um, in, in coming to the same conclusion, uh, to the same basic principle and commitment, and now also maintaining it. Because one thing is to be able to be carbon negative, but you also have to maintain it. So you have to make sure that your energy matrix, that everything that you have in place will not go out of balance as you, as we all um, are aiming towards a greener future. So I think that's one example of when we think of COP26 and, and what we can achieve. The Whatever we can do individual is great, but the real challenge is to coming across and uh, united forces and to actually drive meaningful change. Um, one other could, you, could you explain what is carbon negative? Uh, in, how can you be carbon negative? Uh, given uh, people are riding cars, uh, driving cars, and, and uh, doing other things that uh, you still are using gasoline for the moment. I, I imagine your power system, the, the electricity generation is all green. Uh, I imagine you're storing a lot of carbon in nature. So could you describe to us what carbon negative means? Yes. Um, it, so we um, um, are, we re receive or we put out less than what we receive. And uh, the, the way to think about this or the interesting aspect of this is yes, our energy matrix is not completely, but it's very uh, green but it's not the only aspect. 
we've had for a number of years two driving forces that have uh, been able or maintain a very green uh, country. One being there is a protection by law of indigenous populations and where they live. And that is massive. It's almost 60 or 70% of the country. And in addition to that, because of the Panama Canal and the water reserve, there's also reserve land to make sure that there is enough rainfall uh, to account for the water that the Panama Canal needs. So all those factors and uh, have layered one on top of the other, creating this environment where we at all times are able to, to maintain this. Um, what, what, it, what is the power, is, is the power hydropower mainly or? Mostly hydropower, yes. We, uh -huh. we have also a fuel base, a fossil fuel base, but it's mostly hydro, yes. And it, uh, to uh, secure your uh, number one rank in the world of uh, negative, we're together with uh, Bhutan and, and Sur Suriname is the third, actually, you mentioned? Yes, Suriname, yeah. Bhutan, and Panama. I did not. Okay, we did not know that. I did not know that. So this is uh, great to know. Um, are you going to electrification of vehicles and trying to uh, actually uh, even drive out the remaining little bit of fossil fuels? Yes, yeah, so we have um, very aggressive um, objectives in all those fronts uh, on the energy matrix, on the electrification of cars. There's a, a very, um, I think, exciting and aggressive. And I think it goes to, uh, I'll say a little bit, in how do you maintain that? And when it comes to citizens, so it's not, not only poli public policy driven, but they, your actual citizens are believing. And then it goes to the identity. There are certain pride now within Panamanians of being carbon negative. So now this identity value percolates into people embracing, uh, our people embracing the idea and any new initiative, it seems to be very well, well received from our citizens. So I think that goes to the identity and this sort of pride of what you have and, and being able to maintain it. And you send our congratulations also, because uh, this is it's it's really a great accomplishment and, and uh, something to really something to admire. Can you describe what uh, climate change threatens uh, for the Panama Canal itself? Because uh, I imagine that's a major concern. And what are the concerns, actually? Yeah, it, it, so in the last decade, we had less waterfall or rainfall, that, less rainfall than ever in our history. And that essentially means that we don't have enough water reserves or fresh water to keep the Panama Canal going. We are going to invest over $1 billion in making sure that there is a proper uh, water management system. And that I think goes to, uh, or, or it makes it relevant to understand on one side, one country that is going above and beyond. So we don't have the goal of being carbon neutral in 20 years or 30 years. We're already carbon negative on one side. And then the other, you can see with exact dollar amount, how much we're being affected by the climate change. And I think this is something, um, that if you go through the Caribbean, there are a number of countries greatly affected and that every time there's this cycle where uh, climate change drives the natural disasters and all the resources go to are allocated essentially in dealing with the natural disaster rather than with ending the, the poverty cycle. Is Panama uh, or the three of you, uh, Bhutan and Suriname, calling for not only follow our lead, but also changes in the international system? For example, you're protecting a lot of land area uh, the indigenous populations are protecting a lot of land area. Do you have a program or are you calling for a global program of payment for ecosystem services or payment to protect the standing forests? Uh, because uh, it seems that <laughs> Panama should be receiving some kind of uh, payments to make sure that the forests remain intact or even growing rather than chopped down as is happening in so many of the neighboring countries. Yeah, I think that uh, this, this alliance also showcases um, the delegates from Bhutan as well as from Suriname kept saying, but we're not receiving any resources, neither are we. I mean, so you have here the three to showcase like a true commitment on one side, zero in terms of uh, uh, 
resources to actually ensure that that is maintained and that um, that the right incentives are there, right, for for the for the proper policies that are uh, for the benefit of the planet. So I think that it's an interesting way to showcase what's happening and what we need to change. You're in the middle of a difficult region, uh, by the way. Uh, are you seeing and it it has not gotten any easier with the crisis in Venezuela, uh, the Caribbean getting hit by. <laughs> lots of natural disasters. Uh, a lot of the neighboring countries uh, to the just the north of Panama uh, in Central America also reeling from what you described, the drought, uh, the uh, lack of rainfall. This is hurting a lot of small farmers who are migrating to the United States and then finding the border is closed and it's, uh, <laughs> there's a, it, it's a kind of desperate situation. And we, you and I have spoken a, a bit about the fragility of the region right now and uh, what, how the region somehow should get together uh, and what could be done uh, you know, to uh, better understand and to dramatize the challenges that are really through the Caribbean, Central America, and much of South America right now. Yeah, and, um, and it's interesting how you can link it all back to climate change. So for instance, uh, the massive uh, migration that now we're receiving mostly from the Caribbean um, because they're going themselves for a difficult time um, just links back to the first, first the principle that climate change is affecting us in all sorts of manners, one, and second, how are we dealing with this and how are we actually making sure that the opportunities or that we're driving um, enough change and support for all these economies that are in a very fragile state. Um, you see it here uh, in, in the United States where they are now, for instance, receiving Haitians that have migrated to South America and gone by foot all the way up to the north because uh, it is unsustainable where they are at the moment. So. I, I think this is a phenomenon that we need to confront, understand, and actually deal with it because it will only get worse unless uh, collectively there are uh, true solutions that involve uh, making sure that the resources are there to promote development. What's happening? You're uh, one of the lead diplomats uh, of the region. Uh, many countries are going through political uh, political change, some political turmoil like Haiti, uh, which is just awful. And it, it seems no end of escalating crisis. Uh, is there a way right now for, for, the, for the Latin American Caribbean region to even come together to find a common voice right now? Because it's so urgent that, that this happened. Uh, and, the whole region is so interconnected, as you say, because migrants come across borders. It, it does nothing stops in one country. Uh, everybody is uh, feeling the ricochet effects. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that there are two aspects that should give us some pause. And and now, as we are uh, at the United Nations, to understand how we should be facing them. The pandemic for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, if you compare it to other uh, regions, was absolutely the worst. We had a lot more deaths compared to the population, more cases, et cetera. Um, countries such as Haiti, for instance, just two months ago got their first shot. So we did not fare well uh, on, on after the pandemic, and we need to recognize it. The first thing is we need to recognize we were not uh, well prepared, we did not manage it well. Um, and the second one, for instance, as we were talking about uh, migration, there's not one country that can deal with that alone. So you can have the United States, you cannot have Panama, you cannot have uh, Haiti itself, Cuba, et cetera, um, unless we come together and we understand that this solution has to be a joint decision in how we face, how we confront, how we deal with this, uh, the better that we'll be at coming at the, there's no other way. It has become a matter of survival to understand that these types of crisis, the only solution is the solution that has to address it and, and have this multilateral fashion. 
And uh, it, with respect to the polarization and the ideology, while there is one that we have to recognize, there are very urgent issues that are in all of our countries. We all have poverty, regardless of whether you sit on the left or whether you sit on the right. We're all, we all need vaccines. We are all um, desperate for this economic recovery. We're all uh, dealing with this migration. Uh, so at the end, uh, they are the same underlying issues and we need to put aside for a moment the political uh, inclinations or wh whether you sit on one side or the other and understand that there are very urgent matters that need to be addressed. You were, uh, by the way, uh, very much involved in the vaccine issues, just trying to get the doses and uh, organize the campaign and you've gotten a lot, but could you describe what happened actually that made things so hard uh, from, from your perspective? Because I think people that are listening would like to understand this better. So much of uh, Latin America was not able to even get doses. Uh, and uh, you know, then they're criticized, well, why didn't they immunize their population? So could you describe a little bit of the milieu that you faced and that some countries still continue to face? Yeah, um, we were lucky enough that we started very early. So, and 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 starting early, I will say, and and um, we have to recognize that when we're starting, the idea of bilateral negotiations is not normal for vaccines. We have a very robust vaccine system in Panama. Never in our history we had to go on this bilateral agreement with the pharmaceutical. The natural way to go was uh, through the WHO, through the Rotary Fund. So, so the normal sort of uh, um, manners of acquiring vaccines. So even the idea when we presented it for, for our own citizens and within the government was not well received. Like, why are we doing this? And I think several countries faced the same. And they said, we're just going to wait it out and there will be this. Uh, the UN will come through. Yes, <laughs> well, uh, there will be availability for everybody and we'll be able to acquire it. And uh, that obviously did not uh, happen. So those that put a bet, I guess, uh, not knowing, because I, I remember when we started this, there were 200 studies, 20 uh, pharmaceutical companies of, you know, recognized and even coming up, it, it was, uh, for countries to bet on a on a company and without knowing that there will be a product at the end is not an easy concept, especially if you have limited resources. So you have powerful economies that could say, "Well, I'm just going to bet in three or four, and one of them will be fine." Well, if you have limited resources, that maybe that's not available to you. So um, there were a lot of challenges dealing with this, and and I think that we were lucky enough that we bet on the right one at yeah, the right wow. time. But that, um, yeah, that's I know. a situation that we need to recognize. Of course, I've been working with Covax uh, from the beginning, which is the international WHO led effort, and they could not get vaccines. They signed contracts just like everybody else, and then. Uh, well, the US or Europe or others said, no, you can't export vaccines. There's an export ban. Uh, we're gonna use the vaccines being produced here first. And so all the countries that did not have your foresight, uh, but went instead through the UN system, which we were championing, ended up at the back of the line. Uh, and until today, that queue is very long. You know, Africa is still, has only 4% of the population vaccinated. And I speak pretty much weekly with the, the leadership in Geneva. And it's very simple. We don't have vaccines. We can't get them. The companies uh, are doing their deals or the big countries are uh, taking uh, you know, what, what they want and so forth. And so this is a, a massive crisis. Uh, I don't know if you'll be participating in Wednesday's vaccine summit, but it gives me a, a glimmer of hope. Well, I, I think it goes, I, that's a very important point. Um, we can all sit and, and analyze what went wrong, but we're not doing anything different for next year. 
And that I think is the concerning part because you can say, well, we didn't know everybody was scrambling around. And now we know, yet for next year, as because this is going to be every year, we're not doing anything different. The same countries are sort of that with bigger resources are allotting and making sure that they have the same amount extra. And then you'll see if you can deliver to some, uh, to other. And then uh, the poorer countries uh, with less resources are still sort of uh, waiting for that first one without even knowing what's going to happen for, for next year. So I think the most frustrating part is that we have not learned our lesson and we're not doing anything different for next year. On Wednesday, uh, there is this uh, summit that President Biden uh, has called, a vaccine summit it's being called, uh, and I'm advocating strongly that every vaccine producing country, so that means China, Russia, uh, India, European Union, UK, US, is there so that this isn't geopolitics, you know, one side or one country, but all of them are there. and that all the companies are there and the companies need also to participate in a multilateral system, not just to make deals. Uh, and so I'm hoping that Wednesday can be a breakthrough and that the UN finally can be actually empowered to have responsibility because right, or I should say empowered to implement because it has responsibility, but it can't implement if there are no vaccines doses coming. It's when you take the politics out of it, because it, from a politics standpoint, it's nice to say that you deliver vaccines for your population. I understand that. I recognize it. But we've come to understand also now that even if you provided all the vaccines to your population, if there's another country out there without vaccines, the virus will modify itself and will end up with a strain that you were not able to prepare your population. So. But this idea, as it sounds okay in principle, when you try to implement it, you still go back to the same, well, I need to make sure that my, my folks are okay and we'll see about the rest. So yeah. Yeah. We're gonna have to change that mindset to get uh, coverage, especially when people don't even have a first dose and uh, the, the variants are spreading. It's, uh, it's extremely, extremely dangerous. What, what's the mood that you're seeing? Uh, you're probably uh, at the start of your meetings this week, but on climate, do you see what you're hoping for or is it still confusion or overcome by geopolitics? How, how do you see uh, the situation uh, in, in New York today? Because we're all hoping that by the time we get to COP26, countries are taking your lead and though they can't be uh, negative right away, they can at least say we're getting to zero at a minimum and by a certain date. I, I think I am, I see, a, I am optimistic that at least I hear the concept over and over. And that is, um, I, I think, a massive change. As Panama, we were talking about this for quite some time. It wasn't at the top of mind in terms of foreign policy or for, for, for several countries. And now it seems that it is an agenda topic in everybody's agenda. And that I think is good. It's positive and should be driving some change. I think the, the challenge is when you try to implement it, where you try to deal with your own politics involved and, and, and it's not always easy, I will say. Um, for Panama, we, we passed a 30% protection of our oceans about two months ago. It wasn't easy. We had uh, the fishermen industry that were not very thrilled yep. about it. Um, so, it, you know, like it, once you try to implement all these changes, you will have uh, challenges. And having this political backing from the international community when you go back home, I think is important. So I think optimistic, but we need to actually drive the change. Are the three of you going to put out some fact sheet or form a, 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 a guiding edge for the world? Because I think it's a wonderful idea for Panama, Bhutan, and Suriname to get together. And if you could explain how negative, what does it mean? And also this tremendous importance, which I think is not well understood, that any solutions require energy and land. So it's not only the energy system, but it's actually energy and land. And then anything about land 
is also about human rights, uh, inevitably. Uh, and so protecting indigenous populations uh, is a wonderful added part of this that, uh, that they are stewards uh, of traditional lands. Also, you're protecting that legally, uh, I think is an extraordinarily important uh, message. So if the three countries could put out a fact sheet, here's how you get to negative even now, uh, and here's our energy matrix, uh, here's our land, here's our spiritual and uh, our, uh, our guides uh, of why we're doing this. It would be very inspiring. I want to use that around the world in the next six weeks because we're in a very short time between now and COP26. There will be several important meetings uh, not only this week's diplomacy, but uh, Pope Francis is meeting with religious uh, leaders on climate uh, in early October. Uh, then we have the G20 meeting. And I think what Panama, Bhutan, and Suriname could help to show this hope uh, and that you're really doing it uh, would be a phenomenal thing. Yes, no, I, thank you. I, we're also very excited and I think that you can see both the commonalities, as you mentioned, on, on the protection of land plus the energy matrix, um, and then also the differences that, because I think that certain people associate or say, well, my country can't do that because we don't live, or you know, we're not just a beach, or we're not whatever it is that they think that makes sense, or we're not just a rainforest. You can do it regardless of where you sit, so long as you have the right policies in place. And I, I think that, Seeing the differences and how you come to understand in Panama, I think that people are now are understanding the mindset that what is good for the planet is also good for the economy. So it's good for you, you know. So it goes to the education and the identity to understand because you need uh, your citizens to embrace it because otherwise uh, you don't come to the to the conclusion or the or the effects that you're looking for. Fantastic. I can tell you, Minister, uh, one of uh, my great joys was uh, at the Panama Canal a couple of years ago uh, in one of the towers. They let me press the button to give the clearance for the ship to move forward in the, in the canal. So it was extremely exciting. Uh, I'm also working and I will be back uh, in touch with you on that with the, the international efforts to make sure that the ships themselves are, are going to be hydrogen fuel cell are going to be zero emission vessels. There's a lot of exciting uh, development uh, with that. I was in Athens recently talking to the Greek ship owners who are some of the largest shippers in the world. They're uh, very uh, determined to move to uh, zero emission shipping that'll come right through the canal. So this is uh, another area that we're going to be working on together, no doubt. But let me uh, close by thanking you for your leadership, which is really exemplary uh, and extremely important right now because we need, uh, we need leaders like you and we need uh, uh, governments uh, and countries that are doing the things that need to be done for by all countries to give that inspiration and guidance. And uh, you're giving us a lot of inspiration. So I want to thank you for being uh, at ICSD uh, and it's a very important and memorable. We'll carry forward your message uh, and we'll look for the fact sheets also so that we can really make this known around the world. Awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. Wonderful to be here. Great to be with you. We'll, we'll be seeing you soon. Bye-bye. Great. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Uh, our next segment of this plenary is going to be a discussion between Professor Jeffrey Sachs and Dr. Agnes Kalabata. She is the special envoy of the Secretary General in charge of leading the Food Systems Summit, and we are very grateful to have her with us today because that event is on the 23rd, and we know that she must be extremely busy with preparations for this very important um, and very large all-encompassing event. So uh, we are really grateful to have her, and we are excited to hear about the, the preparations for that. And I will put a link in the chat as well. I'd encourage all of our participants to check out some of the Food System Summit um, events as well after ICSD is over. Agnes, uh, welcome. Thank it's you. So, so, so good to be with you. And thank you. I can tell everybody listening in, you, you've had the most complicated job, I think, in the world in recent months because the food system 
is everything. You know, every one of us eats. Uh, there are hundreds of millions of uh, people in farm families, uh, vast numbers of people whose livelihood is farming. Uh, and farming, of course, is both uh, being hit hard by climate change, the topic we were just talking about, Agnes, uh, with the foreign minister of Panama a moment ago, but it's also a contributor to uh, all of the environmental stresses as well, the greenhouse emissions, uh, the water stress, uh, the uh, deforestation, and so on. So wherever you look, land use, sustainable food systems are at the center of the global agenda. And uh, you were asked by the Secretary General, hey, organize a summit on this. So maybe you could describe uh, for everybody, what is the UN Food System Summit? It's an unprecedented occasion. And uh, what are the uh, purposes and uh, how has the preparation been going? Thank you, Jeff, and um, thank you for having me at this meeting, and thank you for organizing this. I, I just wanted to call you out because of the conferences you talked about, you forgot to mention that this week we have the Food System Summit on Thursday, the 23rd of September. Well, of course, I, yes. <laughs> so you this, go, <laughs> this goes without saying, that's uh, this week we're right here now. Yeah, very good. So this has been a culmination of um, an 18 months process. The Secretary General in 2019 came forward and asked um, that we, we actually launch the 2021 Food System Summit, really recognizing two things, that we are behind on SDGs um, and that actually food systems touch nearly every SDG that is out there. And the fact that there are the solutions in our food system that could impact our food systems already exist. And we just need to ensure that we raise the stakes enough uh, from a people perspective and we harness the solutions that are already sitting among us. So what we did was to go out there and really start, uh, uh, I would call it a movement or a campaign to, to ensure that people everywhere understand what is at stake from a food systems perspective, that our food systems are not serving that some of the purposes we'd like to see coming out of food, uh, health diets for people, uh, really something that is challenging because we have over 3 billion people that have challenges uh, of, of health, uh, diet related diseases. Then the question of contribution to climate change, where we know now that we contribute about 30% to, to climate change. Then the question of course of contributing to biodiversity loss, which is huge. But at the end of the day, food system is also about feeding people. And we are feeding people, yes, we figured out very good ways of feeding people, except 811 million people still go to bed hungry. So all these are challenges that are very, in, very interconnected, that are found nearly everywhere in the world that we have to deal with. So the summit put in place, um, of course, what we call national dialogues now, we have over 148 countries engaged in dialogues. And the most important part of the dialogues is the pathways they are putting forward. A pathway is a country's strategy, basically, to deliver on a food systems approach, really moving away from the siloed thinking about food from a hunger perspective or just a nutrition perspective, to thinking about food as a combination of dealing with hunger, dealing with nutrition, dealing with environmental challenges, talking about the water we use and all those challenges. And today, I'm very happy to say that now 83 countries have actually submitted national pathways that they'll be talking about at the summit uh, this week. Um, we, in terms of solutions, again, to the call the Secretary General made, he talked about mobilizing solutions from the landscape. We've mobilized over 2,500 solutions, now clustered in 252 solution clusters. And countries are using these solutions to really design their pathways and you can click on a challenge that you or priority that you want to address, and you'll find solution. You not only find a solution, but you find an institution that's behind that, that solution. You find experts that are behind those solutions. So that's really what we've been doing. And then the scientific group has been working on the science of the summit, trying to rationalize where we are coming from and where we are going. And they put out seven priorities that can be put on, on that um, science policy interface and help us move forward uh, on how we can deal with the challenge of food systems. 
They've put out seven solutions that people can look at. And all this information is going to be made available at the time of the summit. So in a nutshell, Jeff, I'm feeling um, really happy that we've come to this moment where we get to show the world what the summit has been able to achieve, but also where we, we begin the journey of delivering against the food system because it actually begins on that very day. The, the journey of trying to deliver against um, a functional food system begins on the 23rd. So it's, it's, it's amazing because people didn't know even what a food system is exactly, like you said. A food system is uh, what's on the shelf of the grocery store or a food system is a, a farm, but they didn't understand it as a system. So what happened in these dialogues when people got together, it must have been amazing at the beginning, just all of the different perspectives. Yeah. So one of the things that has worked very well is um, governments coming up with what they are calling national conveners. And these national conveners are very well placed people. Many of them sit in, in very high offices in the government. And the reason is very simple. I mean, in my own country, as a minister of agriculture, I saw this. You get in cross uh, sectors to talk to each other and drop their individual sector logos and come to discuss how to move a sector forward from, from an environmental perspective, health perspective, agricultural perspective, and even bring in trade ministries and the Minister of Finance and try to find ways of talking about food and the way it impacts health environment. Uh, is, is not something that people do every day, but having that type of convener has helped shape the conversation. And the convener has worked with, from a UN perspective, with the, the each country's resident coordinator where they exist. And this really brought the UN system on one side and the national system on the other side and help bring in conversations that can move things forward. They also bring in, brought in um, what we are calling constituencies, young people, women, uh, and and uh, and farm producers, uh, farmers, officials, and brought them into the conversation so that together they can think about how to move forward. Uh, you know, addressing the different challenges that a food system presents uh, to people. So really, I think with the whole idea of having one stops, you might call it a one stop shop in this person. Uh, it helped governments really start thinking through how they can move out of their silos and come together in a conversation that can transform the food system. It's, it's, actually, it's very impressive because, uh, you know, these dialogues were complicated, are complicated, but actually uh, they're essential for uh, getting a common language on these issues. Because I, I do think the natural thing is everyone has their particular uh, perspective and uh, they don't really see much across all these issues. But let me paint a picture for you, just so, so you get a sense of how, how complicated this can be, but also how profitable and, and, and meaningful it can be. I mean, in, in my own country, Rwanda, when I was work, still working with the government, you have a situation where you're trying to deal with nutrition, but really, or malnutrition. But we always look at malnutrition. Most countries that have that challenge look at malnutrition from a health perspective never from a nutrition perspective. And then we never even, ministries of environment really don't stop to think that actually the Ministry of Agriculture must be the, the, is the number one culprit of how we use this environment in an agricultural country. So for us, two things we did, really moving resources from a Ministry of Health that you're using to deal with the challenge of malnutrition and put it in investing in an, in an investment instrument that produces food for 1,000 days and mothers that yes. were having challenges. So we did make an investment in a business as a country, in a business, to produce food for, for, for kids 1,000 days, which, which is extremely important. This is money that otherwise would go to pay for malnutrition, right? Right. <laughs> but we also are doing the same on environmental perspective where we are removing people from sensitive areas, from very fragile areas, and moving them to places uh, where the, 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 the environment is more stable to avoid the situation where you will have to pay for the cost of not having done the right thing. So these are all beginning to emerge as the true value of food, uh, you know, a concept that is becoming more and more important as in this food system but a concept that definitely would serve us very well because if, if we do it right. What, what's gonna happen on Thursday? Uh, how, is, how will this uh, 
it's so vast. Uh, so uh, what what's the what's the hope for Thursday in terms of uh, the main actors coming together and saying, oh, it uh, I, I get it now. <laughs> so like you you're saying, it's vast because food systems are complex, and one we we've, we made a few mistakes along the way of trying to simplify things, and always came back to bite us every time we try to simplify things. So food systems are extremely complex. Yeah, because every time you simplify, someone says, "Hey, but what about us or our group? <laughs> We're part of this." It's incredible, exactly. actually. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I I will say one thing. Um, now, you know, moving forward, I would say we've, we have a number of pieces that we've agreed on that can take us forward that have built significant momentum. The pathways, so I'll not repeat them, but the pathways are a huge opportunity for countries to define uh, priorities, investment areas, implementation modalities. In fact, in Africa, the Africa already, Africa already has a common position and has already figured out <clears throat> using its existing CADAP mechanism, has already figured out how they are going to undo, I mean, to redo, or adjust, sorry, the word is adjust, or adjust the CADAP mechanism, tracking so that they can start reporting from a food system perspective. So that's already happening. And that's huge that, that a whole continent is ready to adjust its monitoring mechanism to be able to, to, to address the, the challenge of food and the rest of the world is, is, is doing the same. Now, from a solutions perspective, we, we, we have identified so many solutions, but when it came to really picking and saying, you know, these are going to be the areas of focus. We really found ourselves getting into that space where people are saying, how about me, how about, how about the other? Then you realize how complex food systems are. What, so what we've done is we've provided um, areas of focus, major areas of focus, and we've, we see these as five major areas of focus. The whole area of nourishing people, that deals with malnutrition, that deals with ending hunger, but deals with health as well. So that's a critical area uh, as we speak today. The area of dealing with climate, I mean, environmental and climate related issues. We need to address the question of climate change, but we also need to address the question of biodiversity. Then the area of, of uh, living income and, and equity, I could call it the question of equity, ensuring that there's a living income for people working in the value chain, decent work and empowerment of communities. This is something that came really to the fore during COVID-19 with so many people falling out of the ability to feed their families. So that's very critical. And then the question of resilience. Communities everywhere, especially many of us that live around the equator, are not going to be able to move out of poverty unless we do two things. We need to fix resilience as, as, uh, as people that are living around the equator, but also the rest of the world needs to fix the question of climate change. So mm -hmm. there's no way, there's no way around these two. But then there's the, the last point, of course, that we are trying to, to, to address here is, uh, is implementation. How do we get all this done? And there are three things here, access to funding and finance, mobilizing financial resources to accompany all this work. Um, governance, recognizing that food, delivering on food system is going to require governance that brings sectors together, but also brings other stakeholders in, and then innovation, recognizing that this whole process has to be led by science to policy to investment. That area has to always continuously evolve, and it's a huge opportunity. So um, those are the areas that we are focusing on. And in that umbrella, we are allowing people to really define themselves, countries to define themselves and find themselves because it's really critical to, to localize the solution that we are, we are going to be talking about. I know you've thought a lot about uh, what's supposed to happen the next uh, day, <laughs> although all the attention is, oh my God, we've got a summit unprecedented and uh, every part of the world engaged, but how will the process continue onward? And I want a couple of points. I, I uh, want to mention one is that uh, you know I'm I'm uh, thrilled to help lead for the UN the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is a host of the conference. But that's 1,500 universities that should take up this agenda. So how can we take up the agenda in teaching, uh, in uh, new research programs, and so on, and how to get this innovation piece? Into, uh, into the actual work of universities around the world. And then on finance, of course, uh, one of my favorite subjects, we wanna go raise the money afterwards. Uh, so uh, G20 process, 
Uh, Indonesia will be presidency of the G20 in, in 2022. And they've got many of these challenges of uh, land use and sustainability. So I think there's a receptive, uh, re a receptive uh, G20 leader for this. So how do we continue after uh, the uh, summit itself? So let's remember the premise under which the summit was initiated in the first place. The summit was initiated because the Secretary General was not hearing from enough of you, enough of us. <laughs> so, so yes, he has UN institutions, but we are really, really, there, there was a real disconnect from it, when it comes to hearing from the rest of the world. And, and that's very, what the work we've done shows that the rest of the world has so much to offer. So there has to be a mechanism that allows or where the UN is open to ensuring that this information, this knowledge is always coming through. That's why we put innovation as the critical part of how we go forward. We have to be prepared to continuously receive ideas. Young people, uh, technical people, I mean, universities, the innovation that is happening is so fast. The yep. ability to innovate is happening so fast. The question is, our, our, ability to, our abilities to respond from a policy perspective, from an investment perspective, from a utilization perspective, are they commensurate? Are these efforts commensurate with the level of innovation that is happening in, the, in, the, in institutions? And that's the disconnect. And that's the disconnect we must not allow to go forward. Now that we know how we can harness this energy. So every year, um, I mean, every two years, the, the, the UN Secretary General, it's planned. You would hear, I'm sure you hear this on, on, on Wednesday, on Thursday. It's planned that every two years we'll have uh, food systems type of summit. I just don't know how big yeah, yeah. it will be there. And the idea is to, to track many of the things we've agreed on, but also then to track all these ideas that we are talking about. Are we mobilizing finances fast enough? Are we incorporating innovations fast enough? Are we governing right to ensure that we are moving in the right direction? So there will be an opportunity every two years for this to be, to be followed up on. In terms of financing, we have been working with the World Bank, uh, and uh, they put in place what we are, we put in place what we are calling the finance lever of change. And what the World Bank has been doing, which they will present uh, this week at the summit, is a financing architecture that they see that would be critical to how we fund the food system going forward. I will not go into the details of the financing architecture, but suffice it to say that this is being thought through. And the reason I want to go into it is again, recognizing the complexity of funding a food system. And that's why they come at it from an architecture perspective. So that again, give people an opportunity to fund themselves, but also provide a direction in, in, for, for different areas. Some of it will come through what is now being called mass stakeholder coalitions that are looking at some of the major areas, some of the major issues. So for example, a major issue is around school feeding, ensuring that the mm -hmm. 300, 300 million children that are, have fallen out of, of, of ability to have food at school because of COVID can get fed and, and many more. The question of, of an end to hunger, the question of, of dealing with climate, climate change. So there are a number of coalitions that are being formed that are already beginning to demonstrate what solutions can look like when several partners come together. So funding is going to be through um, traditional funding mechanisms, through new instruments that are being created, but also through these partnerships that are being formed. It's, it's really exciting and uh, I, I think very educational and uh, uh, also very much part of what schools and universities should do. And I always felt, by the way, in uh, seeing rural schools uh, at, at primary and secondary level, teaching these things uh, to kids because they're living in the midst of uh, a farm community, but they could learn not only some agronomy, of course, but also some climate change, some global politics, you know, to be each of them can become a food system expert from their own point of view. So I think this is also something that we could work on. It's interesting that you said that last two weeks ago in the we have the African uh, AGRA forum that happens in Africa every year and brings heads of state and other people. The government of Kenya launched what they are calling the 4K clubs. 
and the folk clubs, really it's the, the idea is to get kids very young at a very early stage and start teaching them uh, food systems, start teaching them climate and climate related issues and responsibility to the environment. More importantly, the government was reaching out to other countries to be part of that. So they look at it as a critical effort in the country, but they look at it, they're also looking at themselves as really taking responsibility for how this effort goes across the continent. So yes, from an education perspective, actually maybe the problem we have is that we never thought that we should be, we should anchor everything we are doing today, today into education. We come at it a bit too late, right? Exactly. No, and you know, so, so the curriculum uh, was often made in London or Washington or someplace 50 years ago. Uh, and you look around at a, you know, in a rural school, oh my God, it's the most interesting thing imaginable. Uh, the ecosystem is in front of your eyes. It's not some theory of uh, of, of a kid in an urban setting, uh, you know, that doesn't know it. And so I think that there really are great, really great uh, opportunities, uh, pedagogical opportunities, uh, it, and how exciting the agenda is. It's, it's interesting what the things we are taught. Um, I remember in primary school, they used to teach us how to calculate the height of tides. And the question I had is, what is a tide? You know? <laughs> teaching us how to come through on <laughs> cow peas or beans right. or things that we do every day. I have to calculate the height of a tide. And I'm like, <laughs> when I came to find out what this means, I was just surprised at how misplaced sometimes yeah. education can be, you know. Well, let's work together on fixing that part. That's a, a, a bit of our agenda at SDSN uh, is uh, also we have a target uh, SDG 4.7, which says that all children should learn sustainable development and food systems can be an absolutely core part of that. And we have lots of uh, partners uh, around that, but I think great creative opportunities to bring a real curriculum that uh, makes sense <laughs> if you're in Rwanda, probably measuring the tide is not the best way, but uh, <laughs> measuring the corn stalk may be the best way. <laughs> so. yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, we're, we're wishing you uh, all success on Thursday. I can say to the world, I've watched you at work this past year, uh, and it's uh, so impressive uh, what, what you've done. Uh, and. Uh, People a year ago said, impossible, you can't do this, too complicated, take one little thing, uh, or it's gonna all blow up because you, know, you can't find a, a language around it. And you found a language of priorities, of pathways, of stakeholders, uh, of uh, a way forward. And uh, it's, it's really a fantastic accomplishment, uh, just a great tribute to your yeah. leadership. No, thank you. I think the common thread um, between all of us is we care about our planet. We eat every day. We care about the future of our children. And I think that's, that's what brought us all together. COVID reminded us what is at stake and we, that worked very well. Uh, so I think what we need to do now is just harness that energy that we have demonstrated, take it forward and really build a better future for our children. And thank you, Jeff, for participating in the pre-summit and raising the stakes. That was really good. Thanks, thanks to you. We're honored uh, that you've joined us in a bu busy week. Uh, on behalf of uh, everybody, we want to thank you and wish you all success on Thursday because that's our success too for the world. And I'm asked to announce also that we will have four parallel sessions starting in five minutes. And in the chat, you can find uh, the links to that. And then uh, in about two hours and 40 minutes, uh, we'll be joined by uh, uh, Her Excellency uh, Sheikh Hasina, Prime Minister of Bangladesh. So that will be our next plenary. Uh, and Agnes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's been great to be with you uh, for this time and we'll see you on Thursday. No, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.